Welcome to the CMMID annual lecture. We'll give people a few more seconds to arrive, then we'll make a start. Welcome to the Center for Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Diseases annual lecture. We'd we'll like to abbreviate this to CMMID. I would now like to invite Professor Liam Smith, LSHTM Director, to give his welcome address. Liam, please. Uh, thank you, Keisha, and uh, welcome everyone. I am uh, Liam Smith, Director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, welcome uh, to this event. Uh, and I am delighted that Maria Van Gogh has agreed to give this talk. Um, what an incredible 20 months we've had, and I have to say, um, Maria and yourself, you must have had the most incredible 20 months as a technical lead WHO, and a, a real chance actually to say thank you <laughs> for everything you've done. Um, I've just discovered that in 2015, would you believe, that Keisha met Maria in Singapore, and, that, and Maria was giving a talk on the threat of coronaviruses in 2015, which suggests that she had some magic, that she had magic powers uh, to see into the future, because I can guarantee that I don't think I'd have shown much interest in coronaviruses in 2015. So yeah, you didn't come to listen to me, so I'm gonna shut up. Um, but again, very welcome, delighted to be hosting, and uh, I'm sure it's gonna be a fantastic talk, and I'll hand back to Keisha to introduce Maria. Thank you very much, Liam. So um, I'm Keisha Prem, and together with Rosie and Lloyd, I chair the seminars at the center, it, which is CMMID is a multidisciplinary group of more than 150 epidemiologists, mathematicians, economists, statisticians, and clinicians across LSHTM. And since the start of the pandemic, the center has been closely involved in supporting the COVID-19 response in the UK and around the globe. CMMID also organizes monthly webinars together with our colleagues from Center Support and the Comms and Engagement Offices at the school. Rosie Lloyd and I invite modelers from other groups around the world to share their research with us. The Center also hosts an annual lecture series to hear from the most distinguished experts working in the dynamics of infectious diseases. Today, CMMID is honored to have Dr. Maria Van Kirchhoff the infectious disease epidemiologist and the COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization, who will deliver this year's annual lecture. We've witnessed successive waves of COVID-19 around the world for nearly two years now, and we have seen the rise of variants that are both more transmissible and dangerous. As the Delta variant takes hold, some governments are grappling with whether to strive for zero COVID cases or to prepare to live with the virus. And while government uh, global commitments on COVID-19 offer a way forward success really depends on actions being taken now to address the inequitable access to diagnostics, vaccines, and other medical technologies, as well as the mis- and disinformation on science and health issues. So Dr. Maria Van Kirchhoff has contributed enormously in translating COVID-19 research into policy. She has synthesized a range of modeling and epidemiological outputs into public health action. Apart from being a technical lead for the COVID-19, uh, Dr. Van Kirchhoff has an illustrious career. She also heads the Emerging Diseases and Zoonosis Unit and is the MERS Coronavirus Technical Lead in the World Health Organization's Health Emergency Program. Her main research interests include zoonotic, respiratory, and emerging and re-emerging viruses such as avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola, Marburg plague, and Zika, uh, just to name a few. She's particularly interested in investigating factors associated with the transmission between animals and humans, the epidemiology of zoonotic pathogens, and ensuring research directly informs public health policy. Dr. Van Kirchhoff is also an alumnus at LSHTN, and I'm, and I'm very glad to actually welcome her back to the school again today. In this lecture, she will provide an overview of the global epidemiological situation and the drivers of global trends, 
WHO's comprehensive strategy for the coordinated public health action and possible futures of the pandemic. She'll speak for about an hour and after which we'll have some time for audience questions. Please post your questions via the Q&A function that can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll try our best to get through them all before the seminar closes at 5.30 p.m. UK time. I see, if you see any questions that you might want to ask that has been asked previously, please vote for the questions so that we can actually um, ask those popular questions earlier. Without further ado, let the lecture begin. Dr. Van Kirkhoff, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Keisha and Liam and Roz and Stefan for the invitation to speak with you guys today. It's, it's really my honor. Um, I loved my time at LSHTM and I'm a very, very proud uh, alumni of the school. So I can't wait to come back in person. Um, I can't wait to start traveling again and for this pandemic to be over. Um, I'm Liam, I'm definitely not a prophet, you know, in terms of thinking about coronaviruses. There are many of us who've been warning about this. So I'm going to share my screen and let me just get that set up. Just give me the go ahead that you see the full screen there. Is that okay? Looks good. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I still find all of these uh, webinars and speaking into the, the computer strange. Uh, I really miss the interaction of being in person. So thank you again for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to give an overview of where we are uh, in the current pandemic, um, the current situation, what are the major factors that are driving transmission, and just to have a little bit of a discussion on potential futures. Um, Given that we are in the you know 21 months into a pandemic, two years of into circulation of this new coronavirus, um, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, but we can make some educated guesses going forward in terms of, of in terms of what may happen. Um, I am not a mathematical modeler. I always like to start by saying that I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist who has worked with modelers um, almost throughout my whole career um, and really appreciate the discipline, appreciate the, the skill set and the knowledge that, ma that modelers can bring to a situation. Um, and I will touch upon that in part of this talk. So let's get started. So if we start with the overall global and regional uh, epidemiologic trends, um, what you can see in the upper right hand corner is the global epidemic curve. Um, with peaks and troughs. And, and now we're entering another trough. And I hope that trend continues to decline. Over the last six, seven weeks, we've seen a global decline in cases and in deaths. And while that is a very good sign, we still see tremendous diversity and intensity of spread at the regional level. And what you can see in that epi curve is uh, by region, by WHO region. Um, and on the bottom two graphs, uh, figures there, you see cases per 100,000 population reported over the last seven days. And on the right bottom right-hand side, deaths per 100,000 population um, in the last seven days. So if we look at a national level, if we look at a regional level, a national level, a sub-national level, there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity in terms of spread, in terms of the dynamics of this virus. Um, and I'll go through why that actually is. In the last week alone, we had more than 2.8 million new confirmed deaths, uh, 2.8 2 million new confirmed cases reported to WHO and more than 40,000 new deaths. And while those are lower numbers than the previous week, that's far too many cases and deaths to be reported, not to mention these are true underestimates um, of cases and deaths that are actually occurring worldwide. Um, it's far too many uh, 21 months into a pandemic when we actually have tools that can prevent infection and save people's lives. Cumulatively, we're at more than 240 million confirmed cases reported to WHO and almost 5 million deaths. And again, these are both underestimates of the true burden of disease. In the last seven days, this will be published tonight uh, in our weekly epidemiologic uh, report. If you don't see this, it's published every Tuesday evening on our website. This gives you the latest overview of global and regional trends, um, plus an overview of what we know about variants of interest, variants of concern um, that WHO is tracking at a global level. But if you look over the last seven days, um, you know we, we do see overall, again, a 4% reduction. Um, and there's variation in the number of cases reported this week, the change in the number of cases reported in the last seven days with declines in all regions except Europe. 
In terms of deaths, we've seen a, a reduction in most regions with the exception of Europe and in the Western Pacific region. But again, if you look at those numbers, um, unfortunately, we're still reporting on cases and deaths um, because we don't have better data at a national level on hospitalization rates, on ICU um, capacity. And if I could present that to you, I would, because that's a much better tracking of what uh, uh, the disease that is actually co being caused by SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, but we don't have that at a global level. So we're still tracking cases and deaths and we're looking at trends over time. But this graph shows you that there is some diversity in terms of the cases and deaths over uh, the last week or so. But if we take a step back and we look at what type of patterns countries have seen, countries have experienced in this pandemic, we see some patterns. Um, there are countries that have had repeated waves of infection, and you can see with these peaks and troughs, and these are just nine countries um, selected at random. I could probably have chosen another, another nine, but just showing you this type of repeated wave pattern. We've seen some countries that have really dealt with sustained transmission. They haven't really gotten over the hump. Um, they've seen really intense levels of transmission, and they haven't really successfully been able to, to gain control over this virus. And we've seen countries um, that have had exclusion. You know, they've, they've been able to hold off the virus or the entrance of the virus into their population. Many island states fall into this category. Many countries across the Mekong Delta region in Asia Pacific have fallen into this category where they've been quite successful at not allowing the virus to really take hold and spread only to see you know, future variants of concern. And in particular, these are this is the Delta variant that you're seeing here in this wave of really sharp increases in transmission. And a lot of this is due to the fact that they've had to open up their societies um, because the lockdown measures have been too difficult to sustain. But there are many factors that are driving transmission right now. And we are continuing to see this two track pandemic, the haves and the have nots. Um, and that inequity is really growing every day. I would like to say that it's it's that those tracks are coming more closer together, but we're not seeing enough here, but we have two tracks, the haves and the have nots. And there are several factors that are driving transmission. The first is that the virus continues to evolve and we have more transmissible variants. I'll come back to this in a moment. We have a highly susceptible population. Now we are seeing increases in terms of uh, population level immunity from natural infection and vaccination, but there's an unequal divide in terms of vaccine distribution. Um, we do not have access to the vaccine to those who need it most all over the world. We do not have access, um, equitable access to life-saving tools um, that exist right now. This is oxygen, it's PPE, it's diagnostic tests, it's therapeutics and it's vaccine. And this keeps a large proportion of the world susceptible to infection, susceptible to severe disease and at a higher risk of dying. This is also in the context of increased social mobility and social mixing. Um, we see a lot of movement of people around the world um, because people want to get on with their lives, but the more contact that you have with others, the more opportunities that you have to get infected if the virus is circulating in that population. And this is combined with inappropriate and inconsistent use of public health and social measures. Quite frankly, the use of public health social measures is chaotic. Um, it's inconsistent across and within countries, um, and it is quite confusing to the general public. We've had so much misinformation, disinformation, conflicting messages, and politicization of this virus. There's no sugarcoating this, but misinformation um, results in people unnecessarily dying. Not sharing the vaccine results in people unnecessarily dying. And all of these factors together that are listed on this slide presents an incredibly dangerous position to be in 21 months into a global pandemic when all of us are exhausted. But we're really limited on our ability to understand circulation of this virus because we don't have good access to testing around the world. And there are many factors, complex drivers that are contribu contributing to the diversity of testing rates and strategies around the world. These are listed on the, on the slide here. There's a lack of funding around the world and some of these tests are quite expensive. We are trying to promote the use of antigen-based uh, RDTs, um, which are reliable, which are cheaper, um, which provide results uh, quicker um, and can therefore result in public health actions that can prevent the spread and help the patient understand what they, they need to do to get care, to seek care, but also to prevent the spread of the virus to their loved ones. 
We have challenges with supply chains. We have challenges with regulatory review and approval in terms of the products that are actually on the market to ensure that what is being sold um, is not snake oil, but is really delivering what they say on the package. And that takes time to make sure that you have the right data and the right review uh, to get that regulatory approval. Um, there are variable perceptions of importance uh, of testing and the use of testing, um, even though testing remains a critical aspect of surveillance, a critical aspect of COVID control. Um, not to mention the importance of building up testing capacities in that public health infrastructure for not just COVID, but also for any future infectious hazard um, that will present itself. And, and you know, don't be fooled. Uh, we will have another situation like this on our hands in the future. Um, and there are other factors that are that are driving differences in testing rates. We see huge differences in the amount of testing that is happening in the high income countries, middle income countries compared to low income countries. Now, if we look at virus evolution, um, the virus it, it, as, a, as a natural thing changes. Um, there are mutations that uh, the, the virus evolves, and this is something that is expected. Um, we had the, the D614G mutation uh, that was first identified in January, at the end of January, early February, and quickly replaced the circulating viruses um, by June of 2020. Um, now we have four variants of concern that WHO is tracking at a global level. This is alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And what you can see in the figure on the top there um, are the sequences that are supplied to GISAID, um, and delta is now dominant. There are several sublineages of delta that are also being tracked at the moment, but right now delta is dominant. There are two variants of interest that we're also tracking, the lambda and the mu variant. And we have several variants under monitoring. This is a really dynamic discussion that we're having um, amongst our laboratory uh, technical group, our virus evolution working group, our EPI um, technical advisory groups, so many different groups, um, the R&D blueprint for epidemics um, and others that are basically coming together to say, what do we know about these mutations, the constellation of mutations, which ones um, should be classified as variants of interest or variants of concern? Um, and importantly, how will this impact our decisions about what needs to be done with public health and social measures? Will the diagnostics continue to work? The therapeutics continue to work? and will we need to update our vaccine composition. We have a new technical advisory group on vaccine composition, which is meeting regularly to set up the process to you know, implement the process um, to advise on changes in vaccine composition as the pandemic continues. So far, the vaccines are still working against the Delta variant, but this may change. So if we look at virus evolution, variants of interest and variants of concern over time by WHO region, what you see on this, on these figures is the proportion of the VOCs or the VOI sequences reported amongst the total sequences submitted over time. And we've organized this by WHO region. Um, what you can see here, some of, the, some of the graphs may look a little confusing, but um, for example, in the Eastern Mediterranean region, if I highlight this, this portion right here, doesn't mean that there are other variants that are circulating here. It just means we have a very low sample size um, for that particular time period. But what I would like to highlight on this is that Delta is in purple on this screen. Alpha is in this yellowy orange color. And where alpha um, uh, was introduced, it really took off in many countries. And now we see the same with Delta. And Delta is out competing other variants of interest and variants of concern that are in countries and is now the dominant strain worldwide. We are limited in our ability to understand variant circulation because of the amount of sequencing that is happening, that is occurring in countries, in terms of the capacities within those countries, and those samples that are submitted to GISAID and other platforms so that analysis can be done. But sequencing is improving. Um, and a lot of work um, over the last 21 months um, you know, needs to be acknowledged and needs to be credited by those institutions, those countries, those organizations that have invested in sequencing over time. There are a lot, there's a lot of investment in this area right now, and we are working with partners um, around the world to improve regional capacities for sequencing, um, to support and nurture those regional sequencing platforms like the one in Africa with 
uh, Afro and Africa CDC, across the Pajo region in the Americas, across our Emro region, where, you know, a few years ago when I was working on MERS, everybody remember MERS, uh, sequencing was not done in the Emro region. See, despite having beautiful labs and facilities to do so, most of the sequencing, in fact, probably all of the sequencing for, well, let's say most of the sequencing for MERS coronavirus was sent to overseas lab to be done in Europe, in the US, in, in uh, Hong Kong, for example. And now that sequencing is happening in the EMRA region directly by uh, national um, labs and private labs. And so there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of sequencing, um, but a lot has been done. So there's more to do because it will not only be a good investment for understanding variants of interest and variants of concern for SARS-CoV-2, but also an investment for the future for other viruses. And if we look at virus evolution in terms of geographic distribution in the last 60 days or so, um, what you can see here is the prevalence of these are VOCs. So this is alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And you can see uh, the number of sequences um, that have reported that variant. And the percentages, the proportion is on the left-hand side there in the key. And what we see is that delta is now dominant. Um, it's been reported in more than 190 countries and territories. Um, and this has been reporting in the last 60 days. What you can see on the bottom right-hand corner there is a reflection that Delta is dominant, but also reflects that we have limited sequencing that is happening across many parts of the world. And so again, this is something that really needs to be improved and there's a lot of investment in this area. Now the Delta variant is the most transmissible variant that we have seen to date. Uh, it's about double as transmissible as the ancestral strain. Um, it's more transmissible than the alpha variant and all of the other variants of concern and variants of interest that have been detected. Um, and this gives this this makes reaching herd immunity nearly impossible with vaccination alone. And of course, that's what vaccine um, is aiming to do is to reach that herd immunity level. So even if the whole population um, is vaccinated, if we have 100% of coverage in all ages, we're unlikely to achieve um, this herd immunity threshold um, with vaccine because of the increase in transmissibility. Um, and so we continue to advise, um, and if any of you have heard me speak, I'm a little bit of a broken record here on this vaccines and not vaccines only strategy. Putting all of our eggs in the basket of just vaccines is unwise. Um, we need to continue to use other measures to not only to drive down transmission as well as get vaccination coverage up as much as possible, focusing on those who are most at risk. So another factor that's driving transmission is the inappropriate use of public health and social measures. Now, when people hear WHO say public health and social measures, a lot of people immediately think lockdown. And of course, that's not what I mean. On the left-hand side, you can see a graph from a paper that was published last year looking at all of the different individual public health and social measures that are listed on the left-hand side. There's probably hard to read because it's written in quite small font, but there are a number of factors that are there. These are at individual level, individual levels, at community levels, um, and there's a variety of different tools that we can use to limit the number of contacts that we have with others, whether it's through social gatherings or through our, our uh, employment, um, through our um, public transportation, uh, through et cetera. Um, and this is in the context, you know, the inappropriate use of public health and social measures in the context of increasing social mobility and social mixing um, is really dangerous because if we don't have those measures in place, we're allowing the virus to thrive. Um, one thing that we have from our collective service, which is a partnership between WHO, uh, our GORN partners and UNICEF is looking at preventive measures in uh, the context of increasing vaccination rates. And I found this slide really interesting um, that uh, one of my colleagues presented recently uh, in an internal meeting. This is looking at vaccination, increased vaccination rates and the influence on physical distancing, on mask wearing, um, and on hand hygiene. Um, and if you can look over time, what we, what we see is with vaccination coverage increasing, we're seeing the proportion of people that are doing physical distancing decline. Now, of course, that would be expected. 
um, because the more that you have vaccine coverage, uh, the more you would expect the virus not able to circulate. But you have to remember, and I think all of you, I don't, I don't need to remind you, but the main purpose of vaccine and vaccination is to prevent severe disease and death. And I'll come to this in a moment. It's incredibly, these vaccines, it's astonishing that we have so many safe and effective vaccines. We were reflecting back recently um, and thinking back to April, May, June of last year, even into September, October, and reflecting on the fact that there was no guarantee that we would actually have a vaccine for COVID-19. And the fact that we have so many safe and effective vaccines is really astonishing. Um, but the main purpose of the vaccine is to prevent against severe disease and death. But we still need people to adhere to measures to reduce the spread, because if we don't, we will have the possibility of more virus variants. Now, this is just a placeholder here just to acknowledge um, that this pandemic has had a massive impact on our mental health. Um, I could probably spend the next hour of this. I'm sure every single one of you um, has had has been directly affected by this pandemic. Um, and I, uh, you know, I don't think the world has even begun to dealt with the trauma of this. I don't think we've really even begun to mourn the loss um, that we have directly experienced, whether it's a loss of a loved one, or a family member, a friend, um, the loss of livelihood, the loss of um, the social connection that we've had with others, the impact on younger, younger people who have been the hardest hit, um, the impact of older individuals um, who have not seen their loved ones um, who, or who have died alone and didn't have that dignity to be able to, to be surrounded by their loved ones. Um, we've seen incredible impacts on um, violence against women, violence against health workers. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I don't, I don't think we've really begun to really understand the impact of this yet. There are many incredible people around the world who are working on this. Um, but this is something that will take an incredibly long time to recover from. So just a quick note to say any of you who are out there who are struggling, please reach out for help. Um, you are not alone. Um, and we really need to kind of support each other through this. I know this is an academic audience that I'm speaking to, but I'm sure all of you have struggled with this, as have I. Um, I would love to have shown a slide on the economic impact on this, but I frankly I didn't have I didn't have enough time to kind of pull all of that together. But the economic toll that this has had um, has also been incredibly substantial, and the idea that we can deal with public health or the economy that is a false dichotomy. So I think there's a lot to learn going forward in terms of this. So let's move on to sort of the future of COVID-19, and I put this as a question mark because I don't think any of us know for certain what will happen with COVID-19. But there are many factors that we need to consider um, when we think about what will drive future trends. So the frequency and the magnitude of subsequent waves will depend on multiple factors, um, which are listed here. First is population level immunity from natural infection and or vaccination. Um, and we need to consider the following. We need to consider the extent of infection at a global level. And I'll speak to this in a few minutes, looking at seroprevalence studies that have been ongoing uh, since the beginning of this pandemic. We need to look at the extent of vaccination, taking into consideration the characteristics of the vaccine that is in use in, the, in that population and the efficacy of that vaccine. The strategies that countries are using in terms of which priority groups are countries focusing on first, which at-risk groups are, are you looking at age? Are you looking at certain occupations, health workers or frontline workers or teachers? Um, and what is the extent of vaccination coverage and acceptance within that population? We also need to look at the duration of protection with protection against severe disease and death as well as protection against infection. And so these are different outcomes um, that we are looking at uh, when we evaluate the literature. Variants are huge wild card here. Um, the emergence and circulation and transmissibility of the variants of concern um, will continue to be a major factor as we think of the future of COVID-19 um, and we think of the future of the circulation of this virus and its variants. Um, it's a big wild card at the moment. The virus is very fit and it's becoming more fit, um, but it still has room, it still has movement in terms of um, its ability to spread. And we need to look at the use of public health and social measures, the strategic use of public health and social measures. And again, I don't mean lockdown here. 
um, looking at the type of measures, looking at how effective they are versus their cost and cost in terms, terms of financial cost, fatigue that the population has and political and economic costs. We're, none of us are under the illusion that decisions that are made for COVID-19 are only a decision about health. There are major economic factors at play and major political factors at play. Um, and it's not always driven by science. Uh, we need to look at the timeliness of the implementation and the adaptation, the lifting of these measures. Um, the movement of all of lockdown to completely open up and that yo-yoing of back and forth is very destructive. Um, and that's not the intention of the use of those public health and social measures. And then we need to look at adherence. Um, uh, and and this, is, this is a major issue that we're seeing right now is the adherence to the measures. So if we look at population level immunity, um, we've been working with a group out of Canada called Zero Tracker. Um, and through our work on uh, the unity studies where we've been developing um, protocols. Um, in fact, this work began after the 2009 influenza pandemic when we uh, were working with WHO. I wasn't at WHO at the time, I was a consultant here, but we were working across a large group of, of individuals in this group called CONCISE, the Consortium for the Standardization of Influenza Seroepidemiology. And we came together for flu to say, how do we standardize the methodology from a lab perspective and an epi perspective to make sure that when seroprevalence studies are done, that there's a robust methodology that is followed so that we can compare the results across studies across countries. Um, the protocols that were developed for flu have been adapted for MERS, they've been adapted for Zika, they've been adapted now for COVID-19. Um, and we, there are a number of countries, more than 70 countries, uh, I should know the exact number of this, but more than 70 countries that are carrying out one of these standardized protocols so that we can compare results over time. But in addition to that, there have been more than 2,000 studies, maybe 2,300, more than 2,300 studies, zero prevalence studies that have been published to date. Um, which is an incredible accomplishment because getting seroepidemiology studies up and running um, has always been a challenge in outbreaks and in epidemics, um, but we've seen an explosion of these types of studies over time. And what you see on the left-hand side is looking at modeled estimates. We did this with a group, the Sero Tracker Group out of Canada, estimating sero prevalence by WHO region. Um, this takes into account not the 2,300 studies that I mentioned, but about 900 studies that had a lower risk of bias. And we separated out the results looking at a region, but also breaking down by lower, by income. And what you can see as there's considerable region to region variation of seroprevalence estimates, you of course see an increase over time, some estimates reaching, and these are population-based um, seroprevalence estimates. Um, and you can see some of them reaching 50, 60%. Um, the Western Pacific has the lowest um, modeled seroprevalence of uh, around 1% um, to almost 50% in the African region. Now, I'm not giving you all the caveats here. It depends on the timing of the sample collection, the, the assay that was used, the population under study, the methods, all of that. But these are uh, some modeled estimates that we came and what we, this is what we would expect. But what you also see on the slide here on this map is the amount of vaccine coverage per population, the doses per population. And you can see a growth, I mean, it's an older slide. I don't have the most updated slide here. This one's a few weeks old, but you see gross inequity in terms of Af the African continent um, and even across other continents. Of this six point, more than 6.6 .6 billion doses that have been administered to date, about 70% of those doses have been administered in 10 countries. About 50% of those doses have been administered in two countries. And less than 1% of low income countries um, have started their vaccination. So there, there still is gross inequity in this. And we're very grateful, you know, as WHO and with COVAX and through all of our partners for donations, um, but we really aren't where we need to be with vaccine equity. Um, and there's no way to sugarcoat that. What you also see on the slide, is a graph, are two figures, excuse me, two figures that are looking at vaccination coverage by at-risk group. Um, now these show what is reported to us in terms of health worker coverage, um, and also those who are over 60 coverage. Um, and you can see that there are many countries that are not shaded in that blue. 
Um, so it's not complete reporting because we don't always get all that information from our member states, um, but we don't see the same um, strategies being used by countries. We don't see the same level of coverage of these at-risk groups, but that's because um, many countries don't have access to the vaccine. Now, if we look at the duration of the antibody response, um, we see a really robust response um, to uh, in from, from infection. And I think that's a really positive sign. We're seeing um, the risk of reinfection reduced by 80 to 90% for at least five to seven months after primary infection um, and potentially lasting a year. But from our experience with other coronaviruses, it's possible that we will see antibody responses for years, but it's not expected to be lifelong, which is why vaccination is so important. What you see on the slide here in these figures is the, uh, these, are these are among vaccinated individuals, but on the left, are among individuals who have had vaccination following recovery from an infection. And on the right-hand side are individuals who did who were not infected, but have been vaccinated. So there are different kinds of, of antibody kinetics that we're looking at over time. Um, and there's much more that needs to be understood here, but there are a lot of people that are doing this. The, you know, the gold standard uh, in terms of the seroprevalence studies are these longitudinal studies that are following the same individual over time. And those are incredibly difficult and expensive to carry out. But we're also looking, of course, at real world studies of vaccination and following individual over time. So there's a lot to be learned here. And we do see different responses based on vaccine, but uh, you know, vaccine type and of course the number of doses that you have, but the vaccines are remaining incredibly um, strong and robust against severe disease and death. So if we look specifically at vaccine derived protection, um, on the left hand side here, this is looking at vaccine efficacy against severe disease versus vaccine efficacy against any infection. Um, and those that are on this side of the figure here basically illustrate um, that we are seeing a more robust response against severe disease and death. And of course, this is the intended purpose of vaccination. This is also illustrated in this figure here, where we're looking at um, more than five months since um, the time of full vaccination with an outcome of looking at hospitalization and death. The upper graph here is looking at, re at, at infection, effectiveness at, at, if, of infection. Um, and so I think we need to be very careful when we speak about protection, you know, and waning um, protection, make sure that we're talking about, um, you know, just be clear about what we, what we say here, because again, um, the vaccines are incredibly protective against severe disease and death. And I do want to give a, a big shout out to our partners, you know, at the Jenner Institute and, um, you know, Sarah Gilbert in particular and her team and the work that they have done on MERS vaccination. You know, we had the R&D blueprint for epidemics, which, which identified coronaviruses, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and other coronaviruses as a priority pathogen many years ago. And that allowed and kick-started collaboration for setting up target product profiles for vaccination, for diagnostics and for vaccination, um, and setting up the work that was started for human vaccines for MERS coronavirus, also camel vaccines for, corona, for MERS coronavirus. Um, but you know, everyone thinks that the vaccine was developed in 12 months, but of course that began um, with years of collaboration and really hard work in building those platforms over time. Um, and, you know, and, and we should all be very, very, very grateful for that. We also see vaccination significantly reducing morbidity and mortality in the data itself. There's robust data. This, this graph actually shows from the UK, but I could have shown a number of different countries. What you see on the top here are cases and deaths per population. So on the top is cases per 100,000 population, and in red is deaths per 5 million population. And we can clearly see that deaths are reducing. And this is in the context of increasing vaccination coverage per 100 population. Um, and so we do see a decoupling of cases and deaths among those who are vaccinated. Um, and vaccine is reducing onward transmission, but it's not enough to sufficiently bring the time varying reproduction number under one in most countries. So one of the future scenarios we're looking at is high levels of population level immunity around the world where we see morbidity and mortality substantially reduced. Now we could conceivably have been in this situation right now. Unfortunately, we are not. Um, we could have been in this situation if we had used those 
billion doses or probably more than that to date differently. Um, if we had focused on the high risk groups in all countries, um, as opposed to vaccinating uh, everyone in a handful of countries and now looking at boosters for individuals who are already well protected, um, we are not using vaccines efficiently in terms of an epidemiologic standpoint, in terms of an ethical standpoint, and in terms of an economic standpoint. So we don't have that scenario right now, but we could have a future scenario where we really take the morbidity and mortality out of this virus. Um, we have the tools at hand that can do that. We also have tools that are saving lives in terms of therapeutics. Um, earlier clinical care is clearly saving lives. Um, this starts with better diagnostics, getting people into the clinical care pathway earlier so that they have a better chance of, of receiving the right care early. Um, provided by protected and safe health workers, of course. Um, we have living therapeutic, living guidelines for therapeutics for COVID-19, and the bullets here are the recommendations that have been published to date. But there are many also in the pipeline that we are assessing, and more therapeutics are needed. So we have guideline development groups that are meeting, that are regularly discussing um, the, the, those that are listed here on this slide. Um, and our aim to publish is as rapidly as possible be, by being transparent, working with the principal investigators of the clinical trials that are underway to pool the data in real time so that as their papers are published, the meta-analysis that we are working on is also published and the guidelines are published at the same time. And our aim is to have the initial data shared to publishing of the guideline within eight to 10 weeks. Um, and again, there are many incredible clinical trials that are underway around the world that have large sample sizes but there's also many more clinical trials that have very small sample sizes. Um, and so it's very difficult to come to an outcome and to, to understand what the, what the results of that clinical trial is if those sample sizes are too small. The recovery trial is, a, is an exception to that, um, but there are many small clinical trials and it's important for us to pull together that data. So if we look forward, if we think forward, um, WHO has a mathematical modeling network um, that has been pulled together for COVID-19. This is following a long-standing tradition of WHO working with many modeling groups. And in fact, when I finished my PhD at LSHTM, I joined Imperial College as a postdoc working in Neil Ferguson's group. And my job as a postdoc to, was to be the liaison with WHO and to work with WHO and the different programs that are there to see, that are here, to see how skill sets like um, detailed analytics, advanced analytics, statistics and analytics, and mathematical modeling could support WHO programs in terms of the thinking and to develop those projects and to work with people here at WHO and mathematical models to bring that those skill sets together to say, how could modeling uh, analysis support what the program is meant to, to support? Uh, and of course, I came here at the 2009 flu pandemic, and I guess the rest is history, but WHO has worked with modeling networks um, for many, many years. Um, and, and modeling offers an incredible insight in terms of projections, in terms of scenario-based modeling to, to look at what if. And I see, we see again, um, a really important use of modeling right now of looking at the scenario-based what if. Um, forecasting, of course, is a shorter period of time with huge confidence intervals. And of course, the longer you look out, you know, again, I'm not a modeler and you know this better than I do, but we need to think through and what we're doing is working with our modeling network of looking at what if, what's going to happen in the next three, six, nine, 18 months. In my own mind, I'm thinking between now and the end of 2022, when we, when we need that time to actually get the vaccine rates up to our projected goals, the goals that we have of reaching 70% um, of populations in all countries by mid-2022, and what that will mean in terms of how we adjust uh, our, our control strategy and our, our planning for COVID-19. But the model of assumptions are incredibly important, taking into consideration variants, population level immunity, vaccine access, availability, use, efficacy, and waning, of, of antibodies over time, um, use adherence um, to other tools, and of course, looking at contact patterns. I give you a couple of examples on this slide. On the upper slide here is the IHME um, modeling. Down here on the bottom is the US C19 scenario hub. 
And what I find quite interesting in this round of modeling from the US, if you look at the dots here and you look at this line here, this is you know the projection and these are the confidence intervals. The, in this round, um, the actual observed um, trajectory of this um, was worse than the worst case scenario that had been predicted. And a lot of that is due because of the increased transmissibility of the Delta variant and the low levels of vaccine uh, coverage that had have been able to have been reached in certain countries. There's another group, the International Science Council, um, that is doing, there's many groups that are doing modeling. So I'm not doing justice to showing all of the different modeling efforts um, that are underway. But I show this slide because, you know, I, I like the, the language on here. I find the language on here quite interesting of looking at end game scenarios between two extremes with a best case one world scenario. And clearly we are not in this one world scenario. You know, we have these haves and these have nots. And, you know, please make no mistake that the decisions that countries are making right now in terms of vaccines and procurement of vaccines, um, purchasing up of extra doses for boosters is having an impact on global supplies and it's prolonging the pandemic. Um, and we're not gonna end the pandemic in some countries while the pandemic is raging in others. But the worst case scenario of a divided world, um, you know, we're almost past the worst case right now. We don't have, you know, escape uh, of, of vaccine immunity yet, but um, we may. Um, and so I find this quite interesting that we're almost past this worst case scenario before we even have these modeling results um, done. But of course the virus continues to evolve. Um, and so one of the scenarios that we're looking at is prolonged COVID-19 pandemic due to variants with properties of immune escape. Um, and we think of this, if you, if you compare this to influenza, we may see COVID-19 um, take up a seasonal pattern. We don't see that yet in the data that we have, but we've only had uh, you know, 21 months of circulation with data, maybe two years of circulation um, you know, around the world. Um, and we may get to a point where we see some seasonality and it's expected because it's a respiratory virus, but we don't have the predictability um, that we do with influenza in terms of that six month um, planning, uh, you know, to develop that vaccine. So it's possible, it's likely, you know, that we may need to update vaccine composition on a regular basis. We don't know what frequency that may be, but we don't see a predictability that people will need an annual booster. Maybe we'll have something like that, but we don't know the answer to that yet. We have this tag COVAC um, that is meeting to evaluate and work with vaccine manufacturers to advise on vaccine compositions going forward. We also have sort of a measles-like scenario, you know, where we have outbreaks that are th that threaten susceptible populations. This is what's happening now. So vaccine vaccination can reduce the risk of infection, but not prevent all infection or prevent all transmission. We do see we do see good data that's showing reduced transmissibility among those who are vaccinated. But again, the primary focus of vaccines is reducing morbidity and mortality. So we could see a future scenario, and, and this is the scenario that I, I really am expecting, you know, where we have low levels of circulation, which is restricted to geographic areas, um, and we have ongoing outbreaks and epidemics among those who are unvaccinated or insufficiently protected. And this could be because they don't have access to vaccine, um, that they refuse vaccination, um, or that they are unable to be vaccinated. Um, and this is something that is certainly possible. There's a big question right now. Uh, you know, I, I get this question a lot of when, when will the virus become endemic? Or when will we have this switch of pandemic to endemic? And I find this question quite fascinating. Um, you know, will this virus become endemic likely? Is it endemic yet? I would argue it's not. Um, and I am very uncomfortable with the rhetoric and the, the language that I hear out in the general public that, you know, the virus is going to be controlled and over in the wealthy countries while it rages in the poorer countries and that it's not a problem for us because we've, we've handled it. And it's just, you know, it's just a problem for, for uh, lower income countries. That is incredibly dangerous. And again, leads to this, the haves and the have nots. And there is a massive false sense of security that if you reach a certain level of population coverage of vaccination in your country, that you are sufficiently protected. Because we have global circulation, we have population movement, um, we can see the virus is continuing to evolve and we will have more variants um, that will emerge. 
We also cannot forget about seasonal influenza or influenza in general and RSV. So it is possible that we will have concurrent seasonal influenza or and or RSV epidemics. I draw your attention to the graph in the lower right hand corner. Um, this is uh, looking at Gisris and data from FluNet of looking at the Northern Hemisphere and specimens that tested positive for influenza by subtype. You might not be able to see there, but on the bottom, this is 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. And at a global level, you know, we saw massive reductions, you know, if not removal of influenza circulation, RSV circulation. Um, and now that we see societies opening up, you know, many countries across Europe, they've just completely opened up. There are no public health and social measures in place. Um, and I think that's quite dangerous. I think right now there, it's, it's quite simple these days, you know, to watch your distancing, um, to wear a mask. Masks are readily available these days to improve ventilation in our workplaces and our homes, which of course requires investment, um, but this is a good investment for the future. Um, so despite low influenza circulation, uh, seasonal influenza virus evolution is dynamic. Um, so we could see a scenario where we see seasonal influenza epidemics incurring, and this could occur at any moment. Um, and it could be quite severe and it could be out of the typical seasonal pattern. We see RSV actually be uh, circulating out of season um, right now. Um, and this can have significant hospital burden, particularly among younger age groups, but not necessarily only of younger age groups. So it's really important that we have good surveillance at hand. You know, one of the things we also are really pushing for um, in all countries, not just low income countries, but also high income countries is building up of public health infrastructure and making sure that there are good surveillance systems in place, that there's good testing systems in place, that there's a strong and reinforced workforce um, that can carry out um, activities like contact tracing, um, supported quarantine, making sure that our health workforce is sufficiently trained and rested and protected, that we have good supplies at hand. Um, this needs to be surged now um, because we are still dealing with this pandemic. Um, and if we don't make these changes now, if we don't put in this investment now, I really don't know when we're gonna do it. Um, we're going through something horrible right now. Um, and it's, now is the time to make these investments. Now is the time to surge these capacities because we will have future respiratory viruses that will circulate. So what should we expect? What should we plan for? Um, we are immediately thinking through the end now and through the end of 2022 and ending what we call the acute phase of this pandemic. And what we mean by that is really gaining control over transmission. Um, so that transmission is driven down to the lowest levels that are possible. The possibility to eradicate or eliminate at a global level was lost very early on in this pandemic because all countries did not take this as seriously as they needed to and put in a robust plan uh, and, and really aggressively um, attack the virus when it entered uh, into, into their populations. Um, but ending the acute phase of the pandemic also means that we significantly reduce morbidity and mortality. We have the possibility right now to massively reduce um, hospitalization rates and death. Um, and this is through vaccination and it's through early clinical care. Um, and we need to put in the work. Uh, we cannot will this away. So we're planning for now and we're planning beyond. And we're thinking about the evolution of this pandemic and what may happen using the available tools that we have. We need to think into the future of how we in integrate more, not just surveillance for respiratory diseases, that's a given. And that is happening now with a lot of work around GISRIS Plus in terms of the expansion of the network of flu labs around the world, making sure that they can test also for SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory pathogens that circulate. But we need to think forward in how we deal with respiratory pathogens as a whole. So what we should expect in the short term is that we should expect increased incidence of infection um, where public health and social measures are being relaxed. Um, regardless of vaccination rollout, we will continue to see outbreaks. How high those peaks are, the, the magnitude of the, of the peaks um, should be lower given that we have vaccination coverage creeping up. But remember that you know less than 1% of low income countries um, have their populations vaccinated. So there is a gross uh, discrepancy in terms of the uh, availability of vaccines to all population.
The Delta variant has changed the context. Um, the current vaccines are unlikely to stop transmission or stem transmission, even at the highest level of coverage. And we're having intense discussions uh, around virus evolution and how much more change we can expect. Um, you know, will Delta be the last? The answer to that is no. Um, but what are the important mutations and constellation of mutations that need to be on our radar? I should thank so many of our partners that are working with us in almost in real time. And in fact, we're in a we're, we're very lucky uh, to be in a position where we have such good collaborations around the world that the discussions that are being brought to to WHO and shared amongst partners come to us even before the preprints become available. So we get a head start on, on the information that is coming out. So again, we're really thankful to all of our partners who work with us. And so how we plan, um, you know, forecasting of course is incredibly complex because of the uncertainties, but we are looking at the scenario-based modeling and how critical that is to help us plan. We have many tools that exist in terms of supplies and, and um, helping the supply calculation of what may be needed by country de depending on, on the scenario. And we're thankful for modelers in the UK and elsewhere um, that are helping us with those. But we need to take into account regional and local specificities um, when we look at the complex nature of outbreak response and control strategies moving forward. So we still have a global plan. Um, I will remind you that WHO issued the first strategic plan on February 4th, 2020, a few days after the Director General declared a public health emergency of international concern, which is the highest level of alert that we have under international law. I will also remind you that declaring a public health emergency before the point you reach a pandemic is what is critical so that countries can actually take measures so that we prevent a pandemic from happening. I think with this particular pathogen, given that it was a new coronavirus, um, we had a completely susceptible population. Um, we can debate, you know, circulation of other seasonal coronaviruses and MERS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus, but we had a largely susceptible global population. Given that it primarily transmits among people who are mild or asymptomatic, given that it can circulate undetected, unrecognized, particularly in a, in a high flu season that we saw in 2019, the virus was going to spread globally but it did not have to be as bad as it is today. And I think we all need to reflect on that in terms of what each of us has done in this pandemic uh, and thinking about how we use this to plan better for the future. I like to think not about, you know, the what ifs, uh, you know, in the past, but what can I do today? And the very um, uh, fortunate position that I am in as technical lead and health operations lead, how can I use the networks that we have, the partnerships that we have around the world to do something more every single day to bring us closer to ending this pandemic. In 2021, we added vaccination into the plan, into the pillars of activities. Um, and we have a new strategy um, that has been published recently of looking at um, setting targets for the world to vaccinate. So our targets were at least 10% of the population in every country by the end of September. We did not reach that goal at a global level. Um, there, I think, were more than 50 countries that weren't able to reach that. Um, our next target is 40% of the population in every country by the end of this year, and 70% of the population in all countries by mid-2022. These are targets that can be reached. Um, we have enough vaccine where this can be used. We just need these vaccines to be able to be purchased, not even donated. This is not a matter of charity. This is the epidemiologically, ethically, economically right thing to do, um, to share these vaccines. Um, and our director general has been very firm on this. We've called for a moratorium on boosters until the end of the year um, so that we can ensure that people in uh, low and middle income countries, those who are most at risk at their first and second doses before many uh, who are already well protected receive that booster dose. Now, I'm not talking about immunocompromised individuals who need that third dose in that primary series, but we're talking about mass amounts of third doses for people who are already well protected. So to do that, um, to reach that 70% target, we need aligned and coordinated action. We need it from all countries, um, we need the private sector and uh, civil society. We need it through our, um, we need to ensure the success of COVAX 
um, with WHO, Gavi, UNICEF, and CEPI, who are our partners in COVAX, um, to be able to deliver um, vaccines to those who need them. Um, we need manufacturers, uh, we need institutions um, to be able to help us to deliver. Uh, we are working with countries to ensure that there are na national uh, vaccination strategies so that once the vaccines arrive, that they are able to um, uh, get those into people's arms. Um, this is a massive undertaking, um, but I, I don't wanna hear anymore that we won't give them to low-income countries because they won't be able to use them. That is frankly rubbish. Um, we need to support countries in the implementation and the use of these vaccines and save people's lives now, not next month, not next year, now. And so I'll end with just talking about the global strategy that needs reinforcing. So our strategic objectives remain the same and they need to be re-emphasized. We need to reduce exposure. We need to reduce people's exposure. And what we talk about in our public communication around this is knowing your risk, lowering your risk. Know what your risk is where you live, where you work, and take measures every single day to lower the opportunity for you and your loved ones to get infected. Suppress transmission with simple tools. Uh, we're talking about distancing. We're talking about the wearing of masks, avoided crowded spaces. Um, and if there are gatherings that need to happen, take measures to, you know, to, to have them as a safe way, as, as safe as possible, or postpone them. We need to continue to protect the vulnerable, those who are most at risk and cherish our elderly in our communities and not just lock them away. Um, we need to significantly, and we can significantly reduce morbidity and mortality. So these priority actions that are listed on this slide need to be strengthened. And it's not only a good investment for COVID-19, but for the future. Um, we need all countries to enhance surveillance activities, public health monitoring for decision-making, to really maintain a focus on implementation and support of public health and social measures to empower, engage, and enable communities so that they're part of this ride, that they're part of the army, if you will. I know people don't like the, the military war um, like analogy, and I don't really either, but we do need to feel that all populations are fighting the virus and not each other. Uh, we need to continue to scale up research and production and equitable distribution of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. I didn't spend much time on the therapeutics and diagnostics side, but that also needs to be emphasized and strengthen our public health systems, our, our health systems, resilience and capacities and workforce. Our health workers are significantly overburdened and overwhelmed. They continue to be so, and we owe so much to our frontline workers. Um, and we need to, to support them and reinforce them and build that workforce for them and for the future. And we need to support countries to open up safely, but do it in a, in a risk management approach. Um, not an all or nothing approach here and adapting to the local context. I think we do have some ups and downs that we will see going forward, but we need to be open um, and, and communicate regularly with humility um, and be adaptable to change. I, I know this is incredibly difficult. Me being a public speaker on this was never ever part of the plan. Um, I am not trained in risk communication on this and I did one um, press briefing on January 14th of 2020. And I thought that would be my one and only press conference that I did. Um, little did I know that I would, I would have the honor and the responsibility of, of sitting with Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan, and many others um, on, a, on a, at one point it was a daily basis, including Saturdays and Sundays and now once a week. Um, but I, I feel uh, uh, quite humbled to be able to do that. Uh, and I'm not perfect, but I'm I'm doing my best, but our message is vaccines and not vaccines only. We still need to continue with a comprehensive approach going forward. And please just remember um, that this is just, this won't be the last one that we will deal with. So managing pandemic risks is a constant. Um, pandemic protect preparedness doesn't have a start and stop. Um, there isn't a quote unquote peacetime. There, what, there hasn't been a peacetime for years. Um, but you know we're, we we constantly fight this um, cycle of panic and neglect, and we're actually in a cycle of panic and neglect right now in the middle of a pandemic. Many countries are over it; they're done; they're moving on, while the pandemic rages in other countries. And I'm afraid that's not how this virus uh, will operate. So we are either all in this together or we're not. Um, but we can't have the pandemic over in some countries while it's still raging in others. 
So we need to invest uh, in pandemic preparedness now and do better so that we, we don't let this happen uh, again. I think I will stop there. So thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Back to you. Thank you so much, Maria, for that brilliant overview and for sharing your experiences working with the COVID-19 pandemic. You and your colleagues have done some amazing work that has helped us better understand how we can navigate life through these unprecedented times and how do we learn to live with COVID. We now have some time for audience questions. We try our best to get to them before the lecture ends. You can also vote for questions that we would like, you would like us to address earlier. And if you see a question that is similar to the one that you wanted to ask, we would please advise you to actually vote for it rather than to ask it again. It would help us with moderating it. But I'll start the ball rolling with a question. So we are well into our second year of the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are still many uncertainties as you've mentioned earlier. Also the Delta variant is a game changer. I wondered, um, what would you have done differently in hindsight? Oh, oh my gosh. That's the first question. Hmm. Okay. What would, what, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, it's usually one of my gotcha questions when I'm doing public interviews. But I think, I think the, the honest answer to that is so much. I mean, if you, if you look at what we know now compared to what we knew then, you have to put yourself in the position of what you knew every single day and, and how you were learning. Um, you know, some of the decisions that seemed impossible then are obvious now, um, you know, and, and, and that's a hard one um, because I, there's, there's a lot. I think a lot of it were investments even in emphasis even before this pandemic began. Uh, what I am really, really grateful for, though, is the partnerships and the work that we've done with international networks and scientists around the world. You know, people ask me all the time, they're like, oh, how big is your team? You know, and I, I, I like to say thousands because I have this incredible team here at WHO in headquarters, but we work with regional offices and our country offices and WHO is a, is a workforce of around six, 7,000 across the world. But we work with thousands of scientists, you guys included, you know, those of some people who are watching this, who are part of the workforce. Um, I have never had, I should probably not say this out loud, but I'm going to, I have never had someone say no to me when we've asked them to work on something. They may have said, oh, I might not be able to do that in the time frame that you want, or do you have any funding that can support that? Fair enough. But we've never had people say no because people really want to contribute to, to, to public health and use the skill set that they had towards something. Um, I think there's a lot that we would that we would change. But if you if you if I use it with the lens of what I had now, that's really not fair in that sense. But what I would like to see is what we use now. And I mentioned this in my talk, you know, what do I do every single day right now to make today more impactful? Um, if I if I keep thinking of like what I would change, I don't know. I'm not sure I would get out of bed in the morning. Um, but well, I guess it's important to know because COVID-19 is not going to be the last disease X and, you know, what we, we've learned so much from this pandemic and hopefully it will help with us with how we deal with the future pandemic. So yeah. maybe, sorry for throwing that curveball. No, so, no, no. Again, it's, 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 a great, it's a great question and, and it's a fair question. I mean, one of the things I didn't anticipate, if I'm honest, I did not anticipate how polarizing everything would be every single thing would be. I didn't realize how, I mean, if anyone's heard me give a presentation previously when I was talking about MERS, I would always say that every outbreak investigation that I've been on, that the science is getting smaller and smaller and the politics is getting bigger and bigger. This situation is beyond my, wild, my wildest expectations. And of course we know that health doesn't doesn't you know operate in a vacuum there's always a political dimension and economic dimension but i don't think any of us anticipated that every single aspect of this would have been politicized wearing of a mask you know is politicized you are either for one political party or not or you have one ideology or not um i could choose any number of examples and i think that was something that i personally had not anticipated would be as strong and it's and it's still happening to this day so, and, and we need to recognize that this needs to be part of pandemic preparedness as we, as we go forward. Completely agree with you on that. So we'll start with probably a simpler, you know, set of questions now, or maybe something that might, you might have answers to immediately. 
Um, some of the audience actually ask about how you know they can encourage countries with high su vaccine supply but low vaccine uptake. How would you encourage them to get their populations vaccinated? Um, I think there's a lot of different things that that individuals can do. Um, you know, at an individual level, if you're you know you're dealing with groups that have vaccine hesitancy, um, discuss with them. You know, understand why. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from a, a misunderstanding? Is it coming from false information or misinformation? And understand why. Um, we have been working with different groups throughout this pandemic to, to better understand. We've worked with a lot of religious groups, religious faith-based leaders. Uh, we work with civil society. We work with different sectors. Um, you know, to try to, to try to address some of these issues. Um, you know, you can also, if there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy in your country, um, you can also advocate for the sharing of those vaccines to others and the political leaders, you know, talk to your political leaders and give them that space because a lot of these decisions are about, you know, national views and protecting, you know, which I understand completely. Um, but people, individuals can also advocate for the sharing of those vaccines and vac vaccine equity around the world. But I think, you know, dealing with vaccine hesitancy um, and getting vaccination coverage up, um, there's a variety of ways that can do that. But if, make sure you're also sharing good information. You know, if you're going to share something on social media um, or Twitter or something else, you know, just please make sure that it's it's accurate. Yeah, I think fact checking is really important as well. And I think you partly answered the next question that we have, right? Like, you know, what advice could you give like the lay person on how they can, you know, drive campaigns for vaccine equity? And I think you mentioned about how from a country of high supplies, you can sort of lobby or, you know, politicians to help you with that. But what about a country from, you know, with very low supplies and needing the vaccines and wanting it? I mean, it, it's really, it's heartbreaking to see countries that are, um, needing, you know, in desperate need of vaccines, while other countries are, you know, vaccines are going to waste, um, you know, they're, they're expired, or they're not used. Uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, I, I mean, you answered the question and in, in how you asked it. I mean, there's a lot that can be done in terms of advocating for that. But I don't know, I would just argue to fight like hell, you know, do everything that you can. You know, we, <laughs> We need to be blunt. We need to be. We need to be direct on this. Um, there, there is so much that can be done in terms of the sharing of these vaccines, and I think our leaders need to understand that that it, it's okay to do so. That we, as a general public, and if I'm speaking as a lay person, you know, it's okay to share that. I'm protected. I have two doses. I am lucky to have two doses. I also made a big donation to the Go Give One campaign and to others, you know, because I want to be able. I felt guilty when it was my turn. Um, so I think we need to, you know, get the vaccine when it is your turn, but also really fight hard to make sure that others have access to it as well. I completely agree with that as well. So the next question is more about modeling, right? And how it can be used for scenario and where you prospectively look at things, but also retrospectively try to disentangle the relative effects of interventions. What are your views on the ability of retrospective analysis to influence uh, future policy and planning. So this is a question by Nicholas Bloomberg. I think this is a great question. Uh, I would love to see much more modeling being done, looking at uh, public health and social measures and actually disentangling which measures are used when um, and the impacts of each. I, I think it's incredibly difficult work to do. We've struggled with it. Our um, our epidemiologic group, um, Olivier de Le Poulon, I'm sure you know him. He uh, has worked with many of you. Um, Kat Vandemal has worked with many of you um, to see how we look at the use of public health, the actual use, the implementation and adjustment of them. For me, there's a huge knowledge gap here. Um, you know, what we see is a lot of ecological studies of like when policies are in place and when that policy went into place and then we look at um, incidents. Um, but actually looking at the use, specific use of them and the combination of use and then the adjustment of them. For me, this, is a, this, this would be a wonderful area of added value because then the next time we cannot say do it all, we can say, you know, we struggle with being too prescriptive. I mean, 
I don't think anyone would argue we're too prescriptive, but we get accused of this sometimes. What we do is when we issue guidance is we give countries considerations, you know, of what to do and taking this layered approach. And we give um, some idea of the different parameters that can be looked at of how you make adjustments to those, whether it relates to epidemiologic parameters, uh, parameters related to severity, related to capacities and burden on healthcare systems, testing strategies, et cetera. Um, but modeling could be incredibly informative to this. So I hope that there's a lot more work that's being done in this, uh, in this area and that those results are published, please. I mean, I don't have to talk to academics to publish their work, um, but it's, it's important that that information enters into, you know, that, that can be shared so that we can look more. We have a, a group that's looking at public health and social measures um, for not just COVID-19, but for future. Um, they used to be called uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. We don't say non-pharmaceutical interventions anymore. And th there's a reason for that, because from a public perspective, we had feedback that basically made it sound like they were less important than the medical interventions, um, that they weren't as worthy. And so we have seen that public health and social measures save lives. You know, many countries actually controlled COVID with just public health and social measures. Um, so so they're, they're quite powerful tools, but I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done there. Yes, yeah, so I think a very good follow-up would be the next question by Eileen Marty, and she would like to know if you actually have the reference to this public health um, and social measures uh, versus the vaccination rate data, because it would be very helpful for people who are living under settings where politicians are obstructing the use of public health and social measures, um, for example, masks in certain communities. So I think you know if you could share that with them, that might be really helpful. Yes, we, yeah. we can definitely do that. Um, I, it, it comes from that our collective service with WHO, UNICEF, and GORN, and um, we can make that available. I'm sure that there are reports that are being produced. Um, one of the things we're looking at in terms of guidance right now is looking at um, making recommendations around adherence to mask wearing in particular. So I'm sure all of you have seen people wear masks, you know, under their nose and hanging off their ear and, you know, completely it's 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 waste it's it's useless you know if you're wearing your mask under your mouth and your nose you might as well not have something on and in fact you probably shouldn't because the the fact that you're touching your face so much is is not a good thing so if you're going to wear a mask and please do make sure it covers your nose and mouth it's well fitting it has the right level of layers it's breathable and you have clean hands I completely agree with you on that. I mean, we we see people not wearing their masks properly, but we tend to see people wearing their pants properly. So, you know, it's kind of strange how they can do one properly, but not the other. Yeah. Um, so I think the next question is more along the lines of your own personal experience. Um, are there any particular skills that you've learned or, you've ex or experiences that you've had while as, as a student, in, uh, PhD student in London school that most benefited you in your current role today? Oh, um. I, I don't think anything has prepared me for this. I don't think any, anything has prepared any of us for this. Um, what, what, I, what I valued about my, many things I valued about my PhD and my time at London School, um, I was really grateful to do field work um, as part of my PhD um, in Cambodia. I spent a couple of years on and off in Cambodia working on H5N1. And the value of uh, multidisciplinary approach. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. I've never done a project where it's just epidemiologists ever. And I hope I never will actually, I know I never will. Um, and I like saying that I'm not a mathematical modeler. I, I can appreciate it, but I work with modelers. I work with statisticians. I work with virologists. Um, in this pandemic, we've worked with engineers and aerobiologists and architects. Um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing, the reach. And I think my time at London School was also, a t doing my PhD was also a time for networking. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for those partnerships because despite everybody working on COVID-19, it's, it's a relatively small world, if I can even say that. And I think there is a solidarity that we have in terms of, from a scientific community and a public health a uh, community to kind of come together and, and support each other through that. But, but nothing has prepared me for public speaking uh, and a pandemic. I see, I, you know, people people joke with me and they're like, oh, do they know you, you're a household name. I said, okay, I see my car, I see my house, I see my car, I see my office. I occasionally see a petrol station. 
Um, but we haven't traveled. I, I did go accompany the director general to the G20 in Rome, but that's the first trip I've been on um, since I was in China in February, 2020. And we're just focused on getting the work done. I, I feel quite privileged in this position, but it's not something I trained for. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not something fun as well, right? To be in the limelight all the time for something so depressing. Um, anyway, you know, one of the things they were talking about, we were talking about variant names, you know, and we were we came up, we were using the Greek alphabet. This was something that I had I had naively simply put to to the virus evolution working group in the lab team, and I said, okay, come up with a naming system. I want a naming system in a week. And they, they were like, mm, okay, okay, Maria. Uh, and then it was a week and two weeks and one month and two months. And it was so complicated because every naming system that we came up with, there was a problem for it. Um, and then they were saying, oh, we'll just name them like the hurricanes and it'll be like, you know, variant Maria and variant Tedros and variant Mike. I was like, oh, my God, please don't do that. You know, I, I'm already like the face of something so horrific please don't name variants. And I don't like that, that, that um, hurricanes are named after people either, but you know, we thought that the Greek alphabet would be something that people could relate to. And, and I'm in fact, very pleased at how well that's taken off because we don't hear country X variant or country Y variant. And that was incredibly stigmatizing and countries didn't want to report. So that was something that sounded quite simple you know, in practice, but has really had an impact on our ability to, to get countries to continue to report on these things. Yeah. And I think any effort to destigmatize, you know, reporting and destigmatize COVID is, you know, well appreciated. Yeah. We have a fan in the audience who says that this is the best webinar at, at LSHDM, and thank you so much for speaking. Um, and also, uh, maybe coming up to the next question by anonymous um, attendee. Do you see a, a role of the third booster dose for reducing transmission and limiting the impact on the health system in countries with high vaccination coverage? Well, uh, we're very clear on our uh, view of booster doses right now. I will I will repeat it again because I think I think people are right to question it because they're being told that you need that third booster dose. Vaccines. Um, we need the first and second dose in the arms of those who are most at risk in all country before we, we give booster doses in countries where people are well protected. Thank you so much for reiterating that. I think that's really helpful for people to hear. Um, so next question coming from uh, Jin Yun Park um, of IAP France. Do you have information on the duration of antibody response of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine? Is it slower decreasing than the mRNA vaccines? Um, yes, data on that exists. I do not have that in front of me. So every every other week um, in, I also know when to not answer questions, you know, and, and stick within my lane here. Um, every other week, uh, we report on variants of interest and variants of concern. And in our weekly sit rep, we have a table that outlines vaccine effectiveness, efficacy by vaccine type and by variant of concern. So I would advise you to look at that. And we have a website. I can, I can send you those links um, so th that you can have. So, so the person that asked that question can actually look them up. There is, what I will say is there is variation in terms of duration of response and, and, and actual antibody response by vaccine and by dose. I just don't have that data in front of me to say it offhand. I work with amazing people on the vaccine side of things and I leave it to them to give the direct answers to that. Yeah, there are also so many important references to keep track of and you can't have everything you know, at the fingertips. I, I really I really cannot. I, you know, People say to me, they're like, how do you keep it all in your head? I mean, there's so much, I mean, you, you can understand. So we are, my, my team at WHO and through partnerships, we develop guidance, we, we develop advice. And what we are doing on a daily basis is uh, reviewing the published literature, reviewing preprints. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we were reviewing papers that were submitted to journals, not even preprints. And on a daily basis, we're doing literature reviews and we're analyzing you know, the data that, that comes available. And there are so many teams that are contributing to it. Um, and so, it, it's impossible for one person anywhere to kind of keep all of that in your head. But there's a lot of preparation that goes into when we do public speaking and when we do those press conferences, we don't just show up and wing it. Um, this is not what happens. 
um, because it's, it's, we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Um, and, and, and we have this, you know, this, every moment that we're up here and we're doing these press conferences is a potentially career ending moment. Uh, and I've been in situations before where my words have been taken out of context and my words have specifically been used to fit a certain political agenda. Now, I know that I need to be very careful in what I say, but what I try to do every time I speak is I try to talk about what we know, what we don't know, and what we as WHO are doing with our partners to find out. And that's what I can say. And so we're not perfect in getting all that information out. But I think it is important to say, you know, when we don't know or that data doesn't exist yet, or I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, I think it's really important how, you know, we need to prevent people from further politicizing what we already have right now in the situation that we're in right now. Um, so Tom Drake would first like to thank you for your talk and, you know, it's really great work that, you know, the whole team has been doing. And you, you mentioned the need for lower income countries to purchase COVID-19 vaccines, yet the World Bank and, um, anal anal analysis suggests that the achieving higher levels of coverage would bankrupt many ministries of health. Is this... Isn't this the value of global health security um, enough of the need to make donation and a cost-effective policy for high-income countries to sort of step in? Um, and perhaps, you know, this could sort of also be linked to another question by Eileen Marty, where she sort of suggests how maybe tech, uh, tech transfers would be the best solution for um, to address vaccine distribution inequity. What do you think about? You know? it, it's all of the above. It's all of the above. We need tech transfer. Um, we need more production sites of vaccines. Uh, we need to, to focus on the fill and finish um, in terms of the vaccines that can be, so we can increase production supply. Uh, we need donations as well as um, uh, affordable vaccines. We also need more vaccines. Um, there are many vaccines that are still in, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. So there's more in the pipeline. Um, so more of all of the above. Um, COVAX, you know, that was founded to make sure that we had equitable distribution of these life-saving tools, um, needs access to purchase the vaccine so that they can be given to the countries um, in this fair framework that has been outlined. Uh, it isn't one, one or the other, it's all of the above. Okay, so um, probably moving on to, you know, a wishful thinking question, you know, could we look into a vaccine that would actually combine COVID-19 and, you know, COVID and influenza in one shot. And what are your views on that? So we've seen how vaccine can address many different issues. Do you think it's a possible future? I, I mean, why not? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think um, there is a lot more investment now, I think, in, in vaccines. And you've seen, all, you know, plans around um, having diagnostics, having vaccines within 100 days of, the, you know, the next time. Um, but that takes investment in the right types of vaccine platforms um, and technologies that can be, I, I think we need to aim high. Um, whether it's, you know, possible on a scientific basis is a different question. Um, you know, people are still, many, many groups are still working on a universal flu vaccine, um, which would be a massive worldwide benefit um, because flu is a certainty. Um, you know, there's, will always be seasonal influenza. Yeah. Um, there will be avian influenza and there will likely be another pandemic of influenza, um, probably in our lifetimes. Um, I don't want to be the whole doom and gloom, but I think we just need to be realistic and I think we need to prepare, um, prepare for this. And we need to make the right arguments going forward about why investment in vaccines and vaccine platforms are really quite critical. So um, maybe moving on to, you know, a different lens where we look at the role of academic institutions and, you know, um, the kind of role that they play in to help reduce vaccine nationalism and how, you know, to help prevent people from hoarding vaccines, including boosters. Um, do you see a role for, you know, what can academic institutions do about it? And also maybe if you could speak to perhaps some of the earlier predictions by IHR and MEF regarding country preparedness for COVID-19 response. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I could start with the latter. Um, you know, what we've seen in a lot of the reviews of the pandemic response by countries is that many countries had pandemic preparedness plans based on flu. Um, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is not influenza. It's still not influenza. 
I know many people want it to behave like that so that there's a predictability and that there's there's a certainty that we can we can plan and we can have some we can have a few months off from dealing with it and then you know and then have to deal with it in in um in the winter months um but SARS-CoV-2 is a very different virus and what we saw is that one of the struggles I recall back in the beginning was this false dichotomy between containment versus mitigation and this switch that needed to happen in terms of moving from containment to mitigation. But when in reality, the elements of the response, the, the response contain elements of both, it still does. Um, and, and so there was that false dichotomy of you could only be pursuing containment or you can only be pursuing mitigation. And that really, that really hurt, that really hurt, I think, a lot of countries. But the other thing that pandemic preparedness plans, I don't think took into account as much was political leadership and the leadership by uh, what, and not just political leadership, but primarily political leadership, but also just leadership in communities and, you know, all of how important that was to actually have a robust response. Uh, and I think that that will be different going, I think that will be different going forward. In terms of academic institutions, um, I think academic institutions have a role to play across the entire response. Um, you know, one of the one of the additional benefits of modeling, you know, in terms of even beyond the scenario-based modeling, I've seen some really good work looking, I'd like to see more economic uh, modeling and looking at the cost. If you look at some of the testing strategies, adding the economic costs associated with um, the use of different tools and how they best can be used. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think modeling has a role to play in all of this, but it's one piece of information. It's not the only piece. Um, and it needs to be taken into consideration with other factors that are at play. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for actually sharing your insightful, dis you know, having this insightful discussion with us. It's truly a pleasure having you. Um, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the Centre Support, Comms and Engagement Officers at the London School, whose unwavering support has made this event possible. We've now come to the end of the annual lecture. I'm so sorry for the abrupt, you know, end to it. Um, this event is actually recorded. You'll be able to access the recordings for today's lecture on the event listing page. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to having you with us at the next CMMID event. Bye, Thank everyone. you so much. Bye, everyone.